Good afternoon and welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure and privilege to introduce you to Professor Jean-Pierre Cabestan, uh, who will give you uh, the lunch talk today. And I have uh, the pleasure to be the moderator. My name is Christine Letranger. I'm senior researcher and executive director at the Albert Hichman Center on Democracy. Uh, and I'm very happy to organize this uh, public event together with the University of Geneva and the Department of East Asian Studies uh, with uh, Professor Nicolas Zufray today. Uh, so we have this provocative title, which is China's future democracy or the dictatorship, rule of law or rule by law. And the presentation will be made by a China expert, uh, Professor Cabestan, is a um, professor of political science at the Department of Government and International Studies at Hong Kong Baptist University. He's also associate researcher at the Asia Center in Paris and uh, at the French Center for Research on Contemporary China in Hong Kong. Prior to that, he was senior researcher of the French National Science Center for Scientific Research as well as director of the French Research Center on Contemporary China in Hong Kong. Some of his main themes of research are Chinese politics and law, China's foreign and security policies, China-Taiwan relations, and Taiwanese politics. Among his recent publications are the co-edited volume Political Changes in Taiwan under Ma Jingzhu, Partisan Conflict, Policy Choices, External Constraints, and Security Challenges, which provides a comprehensive analysis of the return of the Kuomintang to power and examines the significant domestic and international challenges and changes that have characterized Taiwan since 2008. Um, I, will, I will skip part of your long biography and long publication list to mention the core uh, uh, part of your work that you will discuss today, uh, which is developed in your new, newly published book, which is entitled Demain la Chine, Democracy, Democracy ou Dictature, in which you explore the fragility of the gradual evolution of China towards a democracy and rule of law by carefully analyzing the actual functioning of the Chinese political system and its relationship with Chinese society. He argues that China is much more likely to maintain an authoritarian modernizing regime. And we will hear today uh, why, why this thought of the evolution of uh, the Chinese political system. So this lecture is also part of a lecture series on the rule of law, which is organized by the Albert Hichman Center on Democracy. And so we welcome you all to this talk. And I leave the floor to Jean-Pierre Cabestan, thanking him for coming today from Hong Kong. I mean, he arrived two days ago, but thank you very much for being here with us. Well, thanks a lot, Christine, for this kind introduction. Um, actually, the reason I'm here is I've been invited to participate in a very interesting two-day conference on the, um, at the, organized by the Hirschman Center, the Albert Hirschman Center here at this uh, institution. Uh, on the margins in, and the role of the margins in politics and how the margins may influence the center. And that's, uh, I think, uh, a very good occasion to sort of uh, look at um, also what, what's going on in China. And I'm always very happy to be back uh, in Geneva. Some of you may know I have some also Swiss roots, uh, not from Geneva exactly, more for, from the canton of Vaux, uh, which is uh, next door, but uh, different from Geneva, as you know. And um, it's always a pleasure also to be back to a Francophone country because uh, some of my publications are still in French, uh, this, including the latest uh, book, which is uh, uh, titled, uh, as you can see, De la Chine, um, Democracy or Dictature? Question mark. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, there's been, uh, an English translation has been completed and I can't yet tell you which publisher is going to publish it, but it should be published in the coming months. Um, it's an updated version of this uh, book, uh, since this book was written, mainly written in the summer of last year, 2017. Um, now, I don't know whether the title is provocative or not. Uh, it's mainly binary, and that's, that's maybe more questionable. 
you know, you have to choose between dictatorship and democracy and whether China is going to make that choice in the coming years or, uh, or whether it will evolve towards something much more uh, ambiguous, which is a mixture of dictatorship, a one-party system, but also maybe with elements of democracy and rule of law. Uh, um, although m my book is ma mainly on the political system rather than the legal system, but I, I have some developments on the legal reforms in China, but I think, I think they also have a pretty important uh, um, impact on, on the political system and they have a, a political signification, I think, for the future of the regime as well. Now, my main argument, I think, was sort of summarized already by, um, by, by Christine. And the reason I actually I wrote that book is for a few years it's been a debate, a global debate, of course, sort of initiated by a number of American political scientists, including David Shambo uh, and others uh, in the last few years. And um, now David Shambo, who's a good friend of mine, but with whom I disagree, published uh, in 2015 a book called China's Future, uh, which argues that Xi Jinping has uh, moved toward a very kind of hard authoritarian uh, mode of government, and that's not sustainable. It will need to come back to a more relaxed, more softer um, type of authoritarianism, and even in the longer run, uh, kind of semi-democracy. If China wants to continue to develop, if China wants to continue to innovate and, 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 and succeed in, uh, for instance, completing his China 2025 plan, which is a very ambitious plan aimed at putting China at the top uh, of, the, uh, w w of the world in terms of uh, uh, innovation, uh, high tech, all the way from electric cars to robotics, uh, inter intelligent, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. Um, this is, an, I understand this argument, so without freedom you can't innovate, I mean to put it simply. Um, but also, uh, there were other people, like uh, Min Zinpei, who's also a good friend based in California, Pei Min Xin in Chinese, who has worked extensively on corruption in China, and his argument is that uh, in view of the level of corruption, the inability of the party to um, improve the situation, to ferret out corruption, they, uh, they, they will be some, some kind of political transformation down the road, uh, and the life expectancy of the People's Republic can't be longer than the life expectancy of the Soviet Union. So that's kind of argument. And you, so some kind of democracy or some kind of political evolution will take place in the coming years. Um, now, there are reasons to, of course, have some, some doubts about the, uh, the strength of the regime. And I don't know if you remember the 2012 uh, crisis in China with the Bosilai affair. And a number of people have been pretty... Um, convinced before, prior to 2012, that the regime was strong, that everything was perfect, you know, the, in the, in the, the country and the party, Communist Party, which is really the rule of the country, was adapting to the new environment it has created. Um, people kind of started to have some doubts with the Bosilai affair, the fractures within the party leadership, um, and, and the, uh, including someone you may have heard of called Andrew Nathan, who has coined the expression authoritarian resilience. Uh, and he, he started to have some doubts about the, the, how resilient the system would be in 2012. So, so there was sort of a new environment, including among academics, uh, who started to think that maybe we have to uh, envisage the uh, a transformation, political transformation of, of the regime. On the other hand, you've got a number of people uh, and academics, including academics, who thought that, who, who, who said a number of, who did a number of um, um, field research in China um, and organized opinion surveys or, and, um, and uh, sort of reached another conclusion, which is the fact that the regime is popular, the government is supported by most people in China, uh, and, and, and the political values to which the Chinese society still stick to or uh, adhere to are quite authoritarian. Uh, privileging security of our liberty, uh, stability of a chaos or political activism. And, uh, and, and so there is no, and for, for according to those surveys, uh, clearly there is no support for within the society or strong support within the society for a change, for, for uh, uh, moving the country and the regime towards more 
towards democracy or another political system. One of the authors is well known is at the University of uh, Was uh, George Washington University in, in DC. His name is Bruce Dixon. But many other surveys have led to the kind of conclusion. Now, on that backdrop, I decided to uh, write this essay, which is to try to look at the system as the way it is and why it won't uh, actually uh, move towards um, um, uh, 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 democracy in the coming 20 or 30 years. Now, the first thing is um, uh, I'm trying to understand is, you know, I've published on the political system in the past, and I would try, I try to, first of all, to sort of uh, lay the ground for the, uh, the uh, political institutions, the way they operate, with the, these two facets, which are uh, quite interesting to oppose, because you've got a party side, which is very opaque, uh, which operates like a secret society, uh, the uh, leadership changes at the top, uh, the transfer of power is still organized according to rules we don't really understand, more, mainly cooptation, but also factional game. Uh, that's the sort of traditional Leninist side. And then you've got a much more modernized side, uh, the, the facade which operates with the rest of the world, uh, the state council, the government, the state institutions, the administration, and the civil servants. And it's this mixture which has made the party state, you know, what we can call the party state in China, uh, a very strong, um, a very strong in adapting and very able in adapting to the new environment. Uh, uh, and and I think here uh, we, one of the interesting things we which we need re to remember is that the uh, Communist Party, and it started just after the Tiananmen and the end of the Cold War, has learned quite a number of lessons from the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, so it goes back to actually uh, Tang Xiaoping's uh, decision to go to the south in uh, 1992 and to relaunch economic reforms. Um, Xi Jinping has, uh, of course, uh, again revisited the, Soviet, the, the, end, the final years of the Soviet Union in order to learn even more from you know, what, should, what we need to do uh, to protect the party and the one-party state in order to prevent uh, such a similar collapse in the future. And, uh, but he's not the first one to have done that. But I think what is important to remember that all these various, I mean, successive generations of Chinese leaders have studied since 1991, 92, have studied very, very uh, a lot from the Soviet Union. And, and there's been a, a modernization drive which is um, aimed at, again, stabilizing society, but also stabilizing this state society relationship. That's why the the idea of modernizing the legal system, establishing more legal security, as long as it doesn't entail uh, political stability and doesn't give an avenue to political activists to uh, sort of uh, threaten the system. And that's why you've seen in the last few years a very harsh repression of any kind of human rights lawyer in China. And, and, uh, and people were trying to use or utilize the law and the legal system, the court system, in order to put pressure on the regime and, and force it to change. Now, these, and that's maybe something, I mean, we can discuss in the, later in the, more in, at length in the Q&A, is uh, this regime is not the heir of the 2,000-year um, administrative tradition. It was, it was established, the current political regime was established in 49, um, with, and it's part of a tradition which is Soviet tradition. And I think we, that's something I insist upon quite a lot because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding outside of China uh, about the foundations, the political foundations of the current regime in China. Um, now, they, of course, the political discourse coming from the Communist Party tends to, uh, tries to demonstrate that they are the real heirs and uh, continuators of the Chinese tradition of meritocracy and uh, civil servants and uh, uh, quite powerful administrative system. In reality, I think there are a lot of differences, and what I tried to do in one of the chapters of this book, a lot of differences between the administrative tradition, imperial tradition, and the current uh, political and, and administrative system. I think uh, we tend to forget that the imperial, imperial uh, administration was very small, uh, much smaller than the, the, the one today, was in charge of a few 
uh, sectors of the economy, but mainly um, uh, irrigation, uh, the uh, uh, water conservancy, and uh, you know grain reserves, but was not in charge of the economy at all. Well, today you've got a, a system which is still a mixed economy, where the SOE, the state-owned enterprises, play a key role in the in the economy. Uh, then the ideology is very different. Uh, I mean, the ideology of the regime seems to sort of have moved away from the classic Marxist-Leninist ideology and to sort of re resurrect and rehabilitate Confucian, Confucianism. And uh, that's only part of the reality, actually. Uh, for one thing, and you remember that Confucian was a, an arch enemy of the Communist Party all along the Maoist period, but also because uh, the Communist Party, if you look at the, you know, its constitution, its documents, uh, still promotes Marxism, Leninism, and there was, uh, I think, a lot of. If you if you look at the anniversary of the second uh, 200th anniversary of uh, Marx's uh, birth in, uh, in 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 spring of this year, uh, there were a lot of um, articles published to remind everyone that the party continued to pr promote Marxism and to believe in Marxism as a way of uh, ruling a country and ruling an economy. So um, now, and one of the things which um, today the current regime tends to forget, and for good reasons, is all the political reforms which have taken place in the, since the late 19th century in China. I think those reforms, as they've touched upon the political system, they've been very weak, very hesitant. Uh, but one thing which we need to remember that China was uh, starting uh, 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 in the last decade of the 19th century um, was starting to become, uh, started to become a, a student of Japan, which had re re succeeded its Meiji Restoration and was already, uh, had already introduced a new constitution which uh, put into place a constitutional monarchy in uh, 1889, while China didn't have any constitution. Now, the 100-day ref reform in 19 1898 was a failure, and it was a very weak kind of uh, proposal to reform the political system, uh, but that was the beginning of a... Of a of, um, of a debate in China and how to modernize the political system. And there's been a number of steps all the way to 49, which were all going in the same direction, which was both to modernize the system, to introduce constitutional democracy and, and, the, legal, and, and the rule of law. Now, one of the fathers of that um, stream of thought and, and reforms is, of course, Sun Yat-sen. Um, now, today, the Chinese uh, Communist Party tends to um, uh, revisit Sun Yat-sen in such a way that the, they sort of uh, uh, ignore his, the, the democratic dimension of his message. Um, Sun Yat-sen was a student of Montesquieu's separation of power. Um, he, of course, understood that there was a need for a transition uh, before es establishing democracy in China, hence the, uh, the Kuomintang Turtle Age in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the late 20s and early 30s. But eventually, his idea and his, the Kuomintang's idea was to establish uh, uh, constitutional democracy, what we call in Chinese, and uh, what is interesting uh, is that today this debate is sort of uh, um, uh, again uh, at the center of political reform in China among, among pro-democracy uh, pro, pro, pro uh, activists or uh, human rights lawyers or people who, uh, are, uh, um, who were active around Liu Xiaopo in the late uh, 2000. Uh, in 2008 and all the way, and, and now we are, in the, we are in the, what we call the new citizens movement uh, around people like Xu Zhiyong and others. And that's exactly what the regime wants to prevent, is this debate for developing and putting pressure on the regime to move toward the Xianzhong uh, constitutional uh, democracy or constitutional government. But I mean, what I wanted to insist upon is this debate is not new, actually it started in the, in the 10s, in the, in the 20s, after the, uh, the establishment of the uh, Republic of China in, uh, in, in 2012. Uh, in, um, sorry, in 1912, so exactly uh, more than 100 years ago. And I think today, uh, in China, the debate is more open among academics than people think. Uh, of course, it's below the radar screen because the authorities don't tolerate it very much. But uh, you, you see a lot of people actually debating about those questions. At one point, uh, the, there was a kind of, uh, uh, you know, people, uh, historians, political scientists in mainland China started to uh, sort of revisit the Republic of China period to see, you know, whether, uh, what, what had failed. Now, 
today and what, why China was able at the time to establish a multi-party democracy. Eventually, Taiwan was able to do it much later in, uh, in the late 1980s when the martial law was lifted by Tian Qingguo, the son of Chiang Kai-shek, but that was in a very different context and a different uh, place because Taiwan is much smaller, as you know, than China. Um, but what, what, again, what is interesting is that this debate is, has been going on for a long time and that liberal ideas, liberal ideas have been promoted by a lot of people in China prior to 1949. They've been, they've been well, killed or uh, uh, forced to leave Ch Men in China uh, in 49. Uh, and, but in, since the reform era started in 79, uh, this debate has come back in China itself. And that's something I wanted to insist upon. Now, Having said that, and that's um, one of the puzzles of China today, is that if we talk to people, uh, if you organize, or if you said, you know, organize opinion surveys, most people will sort of be very hesitant to criticize or to even uh, put into question the the one-party system. Uh, the one-party system is, is perceived by many, by a lot of Chinese today as the you know the promoter of. Uh, um, prosperity, economic development, so, but also um, a guarantee or the guarantor of um, social stability. Uh, and of course, we have to bear in mind that a lot of Chinese went through the Cultural Revolution, period of chaos, and that's the last thing they want to see again in China, the chaos. So that's why they uh, uh, also see in the, in the Communist Party um, um, uh, the, one of the major features of stability uh, for the coming years. Uh, so that's the puzzle, that's the, what I would call the democratic values in China or democratic culture uh, is, not, is pretty shallow uh, in mainland China itself. In, in contrast with the other Chinese societies like Hong Kong, where I live, uh, where you can see, and that's why there is a big battle in Hong Kong now, uh, there is a big, uh, um, I think, the, Dominant political culture or political values is a set of values which are very close to a liberal democracy. Not to mention Taiwan, where you've got a multi-party democracy for now more than 20 years. So, um, so different Chinese society have different approaches to uh, political uh, modernization and political um, uh, participation. And uh, now, whether this debate is impacting on China, um, it's it's an open question. On the one hand, every time you have an election in Taiwan, you see a lot of Chinese watching the TV and trying to get information about, you know, uh, about the election campaign and the results. So you, you've got a number of Chinese interested in what's going on in Taiwan. But the majority, maybe not. Or say, OK, it's fine for Taiwan, but it's not fine for the, for the main China, because if we get democracy, uh, that will be chaos. And multi-party democracy is not something for us. So, and the argument of the leadership is, okay, well, we tried in the 20s and the 30s to have democracy, uh, but we failed. And then my answer is, well, you didn't try for long. Uh, actually, was what interrupted the drive for the move, the transition from uh, the party tutelage of the Kuomintang in the, in the early 30s or mid-30s to uh, constitutional democracy was not, of, not only uh, Chiang Kai-shek sort of inclination for uh, strong, you know, strong power, strong, strong leadership, but also the Sino-Japanese War. Without the Sino-Japanese War, I think the Communist Party would not have come to power, it would not have succeeded in taking power in 49, and I think China would have democratized much earlier. But that's something, you know, we, we're not going to rewrite history, but that's something you know, I wanted to sort of, uh, you know, rather provocative way, uh, put to you as, as in order to instill the debate about you know, what do Chinese think and how the Chinese society can change in the coming years. Now, uh, apart from the sort of lack of democratic culture in China today, even if maybe the Chinese society is more pluralistic than we may think, you know, if you, of course, you, you read the official media, it looks like everybody agrees with what the government says, but that's not the reality. Uh, but now we have to look at the you know, whether you've got elements of, of forces within the Chinese society which is going to bring, you know, which is going to put pressure on the regime to change or not. And we have to look at the society itself and whether you have a, in China a, a burgeoning civil society, I call it an embryo, embryonic civil society, and, what kind of, and, and whether this civil society can, have, can make a difference and can have a, an impact on, on, the, 
on, on political impact on the regime. And here I have to be very, very, very sort of uh, cautious and, and maybe disappointing for you. <laughs> Uh, because there's been a lot of debate, you know, whether, well, the common debate, for instance, I mean, which comes up very often is whether internet, you know, the, the, the expansion of internet and social media in China is going to democratize China. Uh, the, the, the answer is no. I mean, the, the, the quick answer is no. Uh, it, by itself, it won't. Um, for a number of reasons, not only because of censorship, the so-called so Great Firewall, and all these people, you know, trying to influence debates among social medias and paid by the government, but also because, um, as everywhere in China, people active on the internet and in social media, they tend to flock together among among people, you know, like 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 man people. So they they, they they create new tribes on the internet, and pe people don't influence them, you know, others very much. So, and that's, that, that's an issue not only in China. Um, now, there's been another, I mean, a lot of developments which also have um, um, raised questions about, you know, um, the expansion of NGOs, uh, whether, and, and there's been a real expansion of NGOs, in particular in the 2000s, with the, I think, a turning point was 208 at the time of the Wenchuan, Wenchuan earthquake, because a lot of sort of self organized NGOs and activists uh, wanted to bring, uh, you know, disaster relief to Sichuan. And that was the beginning of an opening in the NGO world, for some time at least. Since then, in particular since Xi Jinping came to power, uh, what we see is the party has been very clever in invading the NGO world, uh, providing resources to NGOs, uh, making the NGOs more dependent upon the, the party state and monitoring their activities much more tightly than before. So uh, I think, again, on that front, a bit like for the internet, it looks like the party is ahead of the curve, you know, preempting changes within the society. Um, now, another also uh, area where some people have some hopes that things, you know, could change is the revival of religious organizations in China and the revival of religion as a whole. Uh, and it's particularly the revival of Christianity. And, and that's one of the issues of, I mean, for the authorities, that's a, a religion which is perceived with, when well, regarded with suspicion because it's coming from the West. And uh, while the Communist Party wants to monitor and, uh, every religion, it, I think it's, it is more more tolerant toward Buddhist organization, Taoist organization, towards Asian religions or Chinese home you know, religions, uh, that, rather than Western religions, including Islam, of course. Uh, we, um, I won't say much about the recent developments in Xinjiang, but it illustrates how intolerant the Communist Party can be towards religions it, uh, uh, coming from uh, outside of China, and which are associated with political movements um, criticizing the party and threatening its uh, leadership. Now, Christianity is something which is very scattered. You've got the like Catholic, and we have their problem, you know, trying to re reconnect with the Vatican, and it is, you've got an ongoing negotiation. We can talk about that later, but that's not the major force for political change in China. It's more among Protestant churches and what we call house churches and underground churches, as you see a number of activists. Now, I have to be careful here. I mean, as I say in my book, it's only a minority of underground Christians or churches or Christian activists who are active in the political realm. Uh, it's a minority of them. Uh, what is interesting is these associations because people becoming Christian and developing some kind of political activism. And you see that among human rights lawyers, uh, people like you know, Chen Wangchun, who is now in the US, uh, Carl Zuchon and so on. Many, many of them are, have become Christians because they suffered and they think that Christianity and the f their new faith is helping them when they are in jail or when they are uh, intimidated by the police and the surveillance, constant surveillance like uh, Carl Zuchon, for instance, today. So um, that's something we need to watch. But at the same time, the trouble is a lot of all those Christian churches also have some relationship with Western churches, in particular in America. People who are also very active and anti-communist, like Bob Fu in the US, in Texas. And that doesn't help them. On the contrary, it puts you know, them much more pressure on them. Uh, in spite of the fact, I think, that Christianity actually in China is mainly homegrown. It's not influenced by Western uh, denominations. It's homegrown. It's kind of reconnecting with pre-49 Christianity. 
And um, that's something we can talk about at length, but I just wanted to mention that, it, because when you, you look at the human rights movement, human rights lawyers, a number of activists, uh, and people active in NGOs, you've got more and more Christians now. Now, to the point that the, very, not long ago, the Communist Party, sitting with himself, has instructed party members to choose between their f religious faith and their political faith. So you can't be both Christian or you know, Muslim or even Buddhist and, and the Communist Party member, you have to choose. So it, it, which is interesting because it shows that for the Communist Party leadership to be a party member is kind of a faith. You, you're part of a religion, you're part of a religious organization. So you can't be, which, is, which goes against actually, by the way, of a tra Chinese tradition, which is to be, you know, you can believe in different things at the same time, which is very alien to us. I mean, Westerners, you know, if you're Protestant, you're not Catholic. If you're Muslim, you're not Catholic, and so on. But in China, you know, sometimes you can sometimes go to the temple, to the Buddhist temple, and then you go to church. In Japan as well, I mean, people, you know, they, they get baptized and you, with the Shinto religion, then they, they, when they get married, they have a Christian ceremony, and when, when they die, they have a Buddhist ceremony. So um, that's something, is a very different approach to religion. But, but, but the Communist Party has been worried about this revive, religious revival, and particularly worried by two religions, Christianity and Islam. Now, so within the society, you've, of course, you've, you have some important changes I wanted to mention, which are going maybe in the longer run to influence politics. One is urbanization, clearly. Urbanization is changing the way Chinese society is going to deal, to interact with the state and in the longer run, with, you know, get involved in politics. To, today, we don't see any big changes. Uh, you see more and more homeowners who are getting active, but it's not really political in defending their rights and their, well, you know, the newly acquired flat, you know, condominiums where you know, the communions are managed by companies which are very opaque and they're asking for... So it's kind of political, but it's political on the margin, to use a Hirschman metaphor. Um, uh, then urbanization brings a lot of people together. And every time you have a social movement, it's not the same to have a social movement is you know, in scattered villages and around the countryside, and you have a sort of concentrated social movement which can become a political movement in an urban area where now nearly 60% of Chinese live, and tomorrow, in 2025, 20, maybe 70% of the Chinese will live. So I think it's a big difference. Now, the other big change, of course, is the emergence of the middle class. But here, we have to be cautious. You know, in many countries, the middle class has been a, a factor of democratization. Um, in China today, the middle class is very conservative. And all the opinion polls tend to demonstrate that, again, they give priority to security and on, on liberty. Uh, they worried about all the migrants, migrant workers coming in from the countryside because they have, they, they're privileged, and the migrant workers, if they share the same benefits, social benefits with the migrant workers, is going to go against their status and, and sort of uh, 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 um, put in jeopardy the standard of living and, and, and maybe and they feel their security as well. So, so the urban society itself is a mixed society with the majority of um, city dwellers who are entitled to live with a, in the city with what we call the urban hukou or, or residence permit and the migrant workers who are kind of second class citizens but which I mean, it's a lot, huge group of people. It's nearly 300 million people living in the cities without the, the right to get access to all the benefits to, uh, given to cities. Well, it means, for instance, very simple, they have to pay for their education. So they, well, why education is free for if you're a proper city dweller. Uh, and other benefits, uh, health benefits and so on. Now, uh, so so we don't, in the current you know, environment, I don't see the society really playing a key role in um, sort of uh, uh, forcing the one-party system to change. Now, so we have to look at the elites, and I have the chapter on the elites. Now, and here, we, again, we have to make a distinction between the political elite within the party, uh, economic elites, and, 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 and intellectual elites. Within the party, no one's, if you're in, according to open, you know, open sources, I mean, only rely on open sources, uh, according to open sources, no one is in favor of uh, multi-party democracy, I mean, it's impossible. If someone like, let's say, someone high in, in the party leadership is in favor of changing the system, uh, it better be discreet, otherwise uh, you will be purged very quickly, or she will be purged. But uh, as you can see, the Chinese political system is still a male-dominated system. You've got only one woman 
in the Politburo and maybe 5% of women in the Central Committee. So uh, that's something we can talk later about if you want. But uh, uh, so it's very hard within the, it's a bit like Gorbachev. You remember Gorbachev when he became party supremo in, in the Soviet Union, he, he, well, himself, he didn't know what, you know, where he, what kind of, how far he would be ready to go in democratizing the system. But uh, at the same time, I think he had to keep his count very close to his chest if he wanted to do anything. So we don't have that environment. So um, now, if we move to economic um, elites, the new entrepreneur, that's quite interesting. And I think the economic elites may be, in, in the longer run, a factor of uh, change. You remember Barry Don Moore, a very well-known American political scientist, scientist, who said, no bourgeois, no democracy. That's a very well-known. I think China is demonstrating you have bourgeois, but you don't have democracy. And, I, and it can, you know, the system can carry on for a long time. Uh, because most, most entrepreneurs, private entrepreneurs in China, have good reason not to be involved in politics, uh, the way we understand politics, uh, to be close to the party, to cultivate relations within the party state, and to remain as far as, I mean, to be neutral or as far as, uh, from politics as possible. What, the, what a lot of entrepreneurs have been uh, also uh, approached uh, to do is to be, become part of the local parliaments, the people's congresses, which are on the paper elected, but are re actually uh, co-opted by, by the party, because all the members, of, uh, potential members of people's congresses, or what we call the consultative conferences, are vetted by the party itself. So, but but it's a kind of win-win situation because for the for the private businessman, it's it's useful to get promoted in those assemblies. It provides additional protection at the same time for the parties, gives some legitimacy and 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 open some kind of consultation on the margin. But I don't think it's very meaningful. So, uh, to put it simply, most uh, most private entrepreneurs are won't tell you, you know, won't 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 make st public statement about politics. Uh, sometimes some do, and I've sort of tried to trace some of these more daring uh, entrepreneurs, but uh, again, they're very cautious. And so, well, some entrepreneurs supported human rights activists, and they got, they got, they got in trouble uh, for some time. Uh, and so pressure is exerted very quickly on them if they, they try to become, to become um, active in politics. But what I wanted to go to, I mean, um, is the fact that the, the, the Chinese society has changed a lot, and that you've got a part from, the, uh, beside the SOEs, the state enterprises, which are managed the old way by, by the party state, uh, in spite of the, you know, they have more autonomy of management, but the, the part of the party state apparatus. Uh, you've got these private entrepreneurs uh, 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 who are in, you know, a new source of power within the society, financial power, economic power, so even if they're dependent upon the party and the government, and they have to be very careful, uh, the game is not the same. They have some leverage. Uh, that's, and they're not, totally, you know, they're not as weak as an NGO as, or a private citizen uh, in their relationship with the party state. So, so that creates a situation which worries the party, and that's why the party wants to keep these SOEs, uh, and as, as many SOEs as possible, in the strategic sectors of the economy, the commanding heights of the economy. But also, uh, you know, they worry that the private entrepreneurs become too autonomous and get interested in politics down the road. So that's why they, 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 the party now is setting up party branches in, most, in every private company and is trying to keep that link, that dependence link with the, uh, with the, with the party uh, as close as, as possible. Now, so, I mean, in the foreseeable future, I don't see the economic, uh, the economic, uh, uh, elites playing a political role. Uh, let's turn, uh, say a few words about the intellectual, intellectual elites. And here, it's a very twisted uh, situation in a sense that the, the leftist, what we call the new left in China, the Xin Zhuopai, or the new neo-traditionalist, the uh, Xin Ru Jia, the new Confucians people, they dominate the debates. The liberal have less and less space within the debate, at least in China itself. Uh, uh, among private circles, yes, they remain influential, but they have very little space. So, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm here again in the foreseeable future, I'm rather pessimistic. You know how things can change, how the how the intellectual elites uh, can play a role in in changing uh, the uh, the regime. 
Um, now, of course, you've got the counter elites, what I call the counter elites, people who were around Lucy Alpo at one point, who are uh, around people like Su Jo Yong, uh, or Gong Piao, who is now in the US. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm tempted to come back to, to uh, Hirschman and his, and his own um, metaphor regarding the margins. You know, either you choose exit, or uh, and you say stay in China and uh, you, 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 you try to have a voice, but it's very hard. And the question of loyalty is very interesting because, of course, the party wants uh, sort of try to identify, identify uh, loyalty to the party, or loyalty to the country. And the activists are just trying to do the opposite, saying, we're not loyal to the party, we're loyal to the country. And we want democracy, but, so that's why we criticize the party, but we're not anti-China. And that's a quite interesting debate going on today in China. But uh, again, it concerns a very small group of people. If you look at the, the number of, uh, try to estimate the number of what we call human rights lawyer, uh, the so-called uh, uh, Wei Chuan Yun Dong, you know, protection rights uh, movement among lawyers, that may involve maybe 1,000 lawyers uh, out of 300,000 lawyers at most. So, so it's a very small group of people. Now, the active is the same. Um, the uh, Charter 08, which was drafted by Lucio Opo and other in 2008, was initially signed by 300 people. Um, very few entrepreneurs among these uh, signatories, uh, quite a number of uh, intellectuals. Um, and then it, you've got an additional list of a few thousand people, most of them being based outside of China, actually. So people were cautious. Now, what is interesting, and that's one of the limits of the current system uh, of uh, repression and surveillance, is that only Yu Xiaopu was jailed uh, 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 in the aftermath of these, uh, the publication of the Charter 08, which asked for, well, Charter, if you if you don't know what the Charter 08 is, you know, Charter 08 was designed in 208, and, and the, the reference was clearly Vaclav Havel, Charter 77, which was uh, published in 77 by Vaclav Havel in Czechoslovakia, uh, which was at the, at the time a Soviet, um, Soviet political system, so uh, in order in favor of democracy. So the Charter 08 was a program for moving step by step and very carefully toward a more, towards a more open uh, political system. Um, of course, the party didn't like it. It was the beginning of a crackdown against uh, um, pro-democracy people, but liberal ideas uh, in, in, in general. And uh, Xi Jinping has just sort of, sort of intensified that fight against uh, um, uh, liberals and, and, and democratic ideas. But, but, but again, those people are still wrong. And that's maybe the, the flip side of, the, 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 of the, that reality. Of course, they repress. They, we don't hear about them, but they're still wrong. And you see a lot of, um, for instance, uh, we're talking about that during the conference uh, today, yesterday, and the day before. It's, you've got a number of low professors uh, who are not uh, now allowed to speak to Western media, to foreign media, but it's still very influential because they still every day train more and more students. I mean, someone like Hui Wei from Beijing, uh, Beijing University professor, is very influential among law students in China, and. Um, uh, and these people are going to stay around. Human rights lawyers are going to stay around. Uh, Su Zoyong was put in jail for four years. Now he's, he's released, so he's, he, and he, he's going, he, I don't think he will abandon his fight for democracy in China. So, that's some, so the context is more pluralistic than the authorities may believe. But, um, but again, I think the, the, the game is very uneven and very detrimental to liberal and pro-democracy ideas. Now, finally, because time flies, I'm sorry, I've been too long. Finally, what kind of evolution we can foresee in the coming years. Uh, well, what I've said until now gives, uh, I think, do not um, favor a very fast uh, um, um, evolution towards another political system. And what I've I tried to sort of um, contemplate in one of the final chapters of this book is you know what kind of crisis can precipitate a political change in China, and if you I mean if you, and then look at the economic crisis, political and social crisis, and international crisis, and none of those crises are going by themselves uh, to force the one party system to change. Economic crisis, we you know China is facing a slowdown, uh, may very well the Chinese economy may very well fail, fall into what we call the uh, middle income trap, middle income trap. But that's not, the end of, that's not the end of the world for the Chinese leadership. It's going to be more painful, uh, but 
will Chinese will, will the Chinese society rebel against the party because the situation is, will, is becoming more difficult from a current point of view? I have some doubts actually for the reason I indicated at the beginning because the party is not a provider of growth and, and wealth and well-being, but also a provider of security and stability. And I think uh, and the party has been always you know in times of difficulties have been very good at promoting that that that, that image and that role, uh, which and, and, and most Chinese will still buy it. I think. Uh, nationalism also is playing a role, and in, ca in case of uh, international crisis, nationalism will um, much more sort of uh, unify the society around the leadership than, 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 than divide it and, and, and weaken the, the Chinese leadership. And uh, here, well, that's something which has to do with the current situ international situation, whether the Chinese Communist Party is going to take risks and, 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 and sort of envisage some kind of... Uh, heads-on confrontation, a mutual confrontation with the U.S. Here are some big darts. For the reason that the Chinese Communist Party's priority is the regime survival among everything. And uh, so that's why up to now the Communist Party has been taking what, what I would call calculated risks in confronting the U.S., in the South China Sea, around Taiwan, on the East China Sea. So, but we can go back to that in the Q&A. Now, um, for, those reasons, for all those reasons, I think uh, the regime will remain pretty stable in the coming years. I may be wrong. I mean, you know, I mean, that's the, we all know that history is always uh, <coughs> there to surprise us. Um, but I, I, again, I don't think uh, <coughs> that uh, there will be any, any political, meaningful political change in the coming years. Things will change in the longer run, though. And that's how I bring back Fukuyama. Now, Fukuyama himself, uh, and the reason I, bring back, I brought back Fukuyama, there are two reasons, actually. One was uh, that he has changed and has become more cautious I mean, since his well-known book published in 89, the, the End of History and the Last Man. Um, but he said something, he has said something which is very uh, appropriate to the Chinese situation. You can't have democracy if you don't have Democrats. And, and the lack of Democrats in China today. That's my, it's a very controversial argument. Maybe a lot of Chinese people will like, question that, uh, say, no, that's not true. We're all Democrats in our hearts. We, we adhere to democratic values, but I don't think that's the case. Um, and the second reason I sort of uh, re-utilize or, or use the Fukuyama, or promote Fukuyama, is in China, there's been an offensive against him, which is really organized and very uh, unfair in many ways, uh, because he's one of the most astute uh, political scientist in the US, in my view, even if he was, you know, he was wrong for a number of things in 89, but eventually he may be right as far as China is concerned, that because I see the progress of democratic ideas, which are still at the margin, but which may eventually influence the center in the coming years. So I think I'm going to end on that note, and uh, we can move to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, for this extremely rich and it's insightful presentation of in only 40 minutes or so you spanned a lot of different themes from societal issues to political and legal aspects of, of uh, China's uh, evolution, China's present and China's evolution. And I would like to go directly with the questions of the audience. If you could please introduce yourselves before. Yes. First question. Thank you. My name is Zafar Shahid. Um, I used to work in the ILO. Um, I think you've put your finger on the point. Where are you going to get your Democrats from? Is it the 300 million plus migrants without hukaus? Huka, huka, um, and within that context, where do you put the fact that recently you, I was reading in the papers that one-fifth of the billionaires in the world happen to be in China. So is there a potential conflict between those two categories? Thank you. I think you can, you can answer. Okay. Well, I can answer very simply. Um, no, it's a very good question. Um, I haven't... Uh, for time reason, I haven't touched upon the question of inequalities in China. Um, first of all, I think a lot of people in China are now ready to stand up to protect their rights and their benefits, and that concerns both middle class 
people. You know, uh, we don't want to have a polluting factory <coughs> built next to the, 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 the flat they just bought. That involves migrant workers, which are denied a number of benefits, and which have been, you know, sometimes deported outside of uh, big cities. Um, but these, I mean, those battles uh, or those pressures on the leadership are, by definition, non-political. And the act, I mean, the people involved in those in those, in those uh, battles, um, I mean, make sure that they don't become political. Otherwise, they're gonna they're gonna you know get into real trouble. So they don't question the one-party system. And the party has, has been something I haven't mentioned very much in my presentation, but it's mentioned in the book, very good at addressing claims and protests, you know, and, 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 and uh, by, expressed by various segments of society. So of course, very often the temptation is to suppress, to arrest the leaders, and what they still do, I mean, including in labor action, you know, act collective action launched by labor workers. But at the same time, they negotiate more and more. And they know that's better to negotiate because then you restore stability and what we call in China harmony. So that's one thing. So, so that's one of the strengths of the regime, to be flexible and to adapt and to accept some kind of uh, grievances and to address them in one way or another. Not fulfilling all of them, far, far from that, but in, uh, in showing more flexibility than, for instance, the Soviet Union or Brezhnev. And, so that's one thing. Now, on inequalities, uh, that's interesting because there's been a number of studies on that. And the Chinese, I have to say that what concerns the Chinese society is more unfairness than inequalities. Uh, when an unfair situation, uh, you know, um, appears or takes shape, a lot of people will fight it for, you know, against injustice. You know, a very well-known character in China Yuan, which is mean injustice. It goes back to, I mean, it's a very old character. I mean, there's a lot of continuity here. You're fighting against injustice committed by people, or by local bureaucrats, and so you, you hope that the emperor will help you, you know, in fighting against injustice. That's one thing. But the inequality is, I'm tempted to think, I mean, and opinion surveys tend to prove it, that Chinese people are less sensitive to social inequalities than we in Europe. They're a bit like the Americans. If, you, if, you, if you're clever and you're astute and you make a fortune, that's legitimate. That's not what a lot of French people think. Or maybe with Macron they're gonna change, we'll see. <laughs> but, you know, um, so inequalities, yes, but you know, I mean, Actually, among social media, you see people admire the billionaire. They think that maybe, you know, a bit like Ford, you know, the Ford, uh, you know, kind of myth. You, you, they, maybe they will become billionaire themselves. Now, the problem is, it was easier to become a billionaire 20 years ago. I mean, uh, Jack Ma and uh, Pony Ma and others became billionaire when it was easy. The rules were loose and, you know, very vague, and they could they could make a fortune very quickly. Now it's much harder, actually. And that's maybe one uh, subject of frustration. But, but again, I, I want to insist on the fact that there's a book by uh, Lynn White, uh, no, not Lynn White, um, uh, Martin White, uh, well-known American sociologist, who, who precisely uh, look at this issue of uh, inequalities. It's more, again, more unfairness than inequalities, which can mobilize people in China. There was a question. Yes, there. Dave Negonaj from the Institute. I have two questions. The first one is, we have long been equating democracy with multi party system. Yep. However, given that uh, globally, uh, media, uh, more than 70% is dominated by one person Robert, called Robert Murdoch, to my knowledge, how true is equating democracy with multi party system? Or shall we rather elaborate on other um, democratic systems to actually uh, have true democracy? Uh, and secondly, it's a question about China. Uh, do you think that China uh, moving towards democratic or uh, democratic future or towards a dictatorship in the future, how will it transform the low um, paid conditions of workers in the country? The second question. The conditions of the low paid workers in enterprises. Oh, okay. Like whether so the country will be more democratic or you know will be more uh, pressurized by a dictatorship. How will it be reflected? Okay. Well, uh, okay, now I got it. Um, to me, I mean, uh, in the U.S. and Anglo-Saxon countries, we tend to oppose liberal democracies to illiberal democracies. I'm always a bit uncomfortable with that concept because for me, uh, democracy is democracy. I mean, it's of course liberal, but it, uh, 
and uh, you've got a number of conditions for me, you know, for meeting the criteria of democracy. Multi-party system is one. Free election, another one. Rule of law, in a third one. Freedom, you know, basic freedoms, speech, association, and so on. And so, I mean, you've got a lot of conditions to put together. But so we know more or less what democracy is. Uh, illiberal democracy is not democracy, and. And a one-party dictatorship is not, is not democracy. Even if the party claims that he wants to promote intra-party democracy, which has never achieved, by the way, because it's impossible to introduce democracy in a secret society where all decisions are secret, and members are committed to respect the secrets of procedures and everything within the party. And what about the, the people who are not part of the party, the Communist Party? Well, you know, how, how they get involved in politics? And what do, you, what do you do with people like in China who are opposed to the one-party system? Uh, you have to put them in jail uh, because uh, that's the only way to silence, or you have to silence them. Um, so that's not democracy. So for me, there's just one kind of democracy, not different kinds. If, of course, if there are different kinds of systems. I mean, you have, multi, you have presidential system, cabinet system, Westminster democracy, and, but that's within the democracy framework. Now. Your second question, I think, is more interesting to me, at least, because, um, and, and that's why a lot of Chinese still support the current system, because, well, what will multi-democracy bring to me in terms of benefits? So, uh, and the answer is not easy. Uh, will multi you know, multi, um, will democracy, you know, bring more benefits to the, uh, to the migrant workers? The answer is not obvious. Um, now, wh what you alluded to is the perversions of democracy by big groups, big economic forces. The answer is not to, 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 to sort of abandon democracy. The answer is to improve our democratic systems. One of the problems we're facing now, and it has too much to do with China because China is taking advantage of that, is the rise of populism, the rise of uh, perversions, all sort of perversions of democracy, you know. And the answer is to improve democracy, not to, not to weaken and not to, not to diminish the level of democracy. Uh, because clearly China and other illiberal countries uh, or non-democracies are taking advantage of, that, of those weaknesses to promote their own idea and to say, yeah, look, we are much better. You know, we provided not only economic uh, growth, but we provided stability. We, we were the, we're much more efficient than the in building infrastructures and democracy because we need to debate, you can you know, evacuate people, uh, displace people without asking any questions. So, you know, uh, so that we are, in a, I think we are in a worldwide kind of debate and uh, I, I call it my, at the end of my book actually a, a ideological war, I think it's a kind of a war. I mean, and we have to be aware of it. We are in a real battle here. Uh, whether China is going to prevail, I don't think so actually. <laughs> I'm really sad, rather confident about the end of this war. But uh, we're facing a lot of difficulties in the current uh, times because of uh, these, all the problems we face because all democratic elected uh, leaders and elites have been pretty unable to tackle the issues and the challenges we've been facing in the last 10 or 15 years. Thank you. There is a question here. Thank you. Yes, uh, Professor. My name is Hector Torres. I used to work at the IMF. I was several years at the executive board. And, uh, it was amusing uh, to see uh, everybody was concerned about uh, pushing China to um, change the driver of growth rather than being investment and exports, it was consumption. So at the beginning, the, the advice was uh, you can uh, lose in monetary policy, reduce interest rates, so you promote consumption. But then we discovered that families in China are saving targeters. So they have targets of savings. And if you put down the, 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 the interest rates, they save more to meet the target. So the second recommendation was to the government, well, distribute more, give better security to families that they will have uh, pensions, education, uh, you know, housing, be more socialist. It was kind of amusing, all in this capitalist temple, everybody recommending, the only communist guy that was sitting at the table, is you have to be more socialist. So my, my, my question is, how, do, how does the Communist Party in China reconcile Marxism with increased income inequality? What is the narrative they use for that? Very good question. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a question which is, well, at the beginning of your 
comment, this was not very political, it's more, the, you know, whether the Chinese party is going to change economic development strategy. And I, I think, it, and, and the, the Chinese authorities are pretty much aware of this issue and is trying to move toward that strategy of favor, you know, consumption uh, versus investments and exports and consumptions and, and service, and, you know, so in promoting the service sector and, and expanding the service sector. Um, in order to, well, to prevent China from falling in the middle income trap. And that has a direct relationship with how much social benefits the Chinese government can provide to the Chinese citizens. And here, I think we're coming from very far away. Uh, you, you, we had at one point in the end of the Maoist era a social system, but for very few people actually in China. That was for the, the workers and the, the state employees and the workers of, this, of the SOEs, you know, people in the, in the state sector got a, had a lot of benefits, but f farmers, people in the countryside didn't have any benefits, except the, what we call the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, barefoot, uh, the barefoot doctors who were more nurses than doctors, but anyway, they provided some basic medical services in the countryside. I think the, the, the narrative, it's quite interesting because they, they recycle one of the three principles of Sun Yat-sen's uh, three principles of the people, which is the well-being of the people. Now, Sun Yat-sen promoted the well-being of the people uh, 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 together with nationalism and democracy, you know, it's called in Chinese, Sun um, Yi, because he knew pretty well as China was very poor. The, he need, China needed some kind of social democracy uh, as far as China could afford it. Uh, a poor country can't afford a welfare state. So that's why now, and Wen Jiabao and others have been, uh, and Zhu Zhongti as well, pretty instrumental in, in laying the ground of a basic social benefit system for, um, at least for urban Chinese. Uh, it's improving, but it's, you know, and, and the discourse is around this Ming Shang, you know, what we call well-being of the people, which, is, uh, uh, which has been promoted by, by the Chinese Communist Party for quite a number of years now. Uh, it will take time, and again, as I t was saying in my presentation, a lot of people don't get those benefits, uh, the migrant workers. The, rich cities are going to expand the benefits to more migrant workers step by step. Uh, how much people w w will be able to get a pension, you know, and that's a, that's a big issue. I mean, we're starting with health. State employees, yes, they get a pension, but it's going to be, I mean, people who have to save for the pension. Uh, and that's why you, you don't have any significant increase of consumption in China because families, they need to save for first buying a, you know, housing, then, 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 then education, and then, and then pension, so, and health. So, so you have to save money for a lot of things in China. And, uh, but the discourse is to expand, and, and that's the policy actually, it's not, it goes beyond the discourse. I mean, the, the, and if you look at the Xi Jinping's report to the latest party congress, he has not emphasize the, the need to improve social benefits. And that's, you know, and that provides political legitimacy to the regime. I mean, in that respect, uh, you know, he's going in the right direction. Uh, provided he has the means, it has the means to, to, you know, distribute all those benefits to larger segments of the society, which is not yet the case. So, so that's a, it's an expanding system, but the, the worry, and, and I don't think that China will move in a sort of Swedish or Danish system. Uh, far from it, uh, more an American sort of uh, mindset on that. So it will remain sketchy and maybe uneven. So that's why. Okay, I we'll take four questions. So first, there was. Okay, we'll take from this side and then we go back to, to your side, Olivier. So I saw three hands. One. Thank two, you, uh, three, Professor. I'm a law student at the Graduate Institute and I have two questions. One is, do you read Chinese? I mean, read in in the sense that because I think you speak Chinese quite well in the in the pronunciations, but if like most of the papers you you couldn't read it in, in because if it's in English, it's more elite like, so it's scrutinized, so it might not be so objectified. Uh, the, the, the quick answer: Yes, I read Chinese. Good. I've been a student in China for 40 years. I started to study Chinese in 1974. Yeah. Great. And at the time of the Pinh Ping Hong movement. <laughs> you were not born at the time. But the movement against Confucius and, 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 and Lin Biao and Confucius. 
Cool, cool. And the second question actually relates to the first question is that I suppose you have this kind of lecture in Hong Kong and also in Europe, in other, co in other countries, in other cities. And do you think uh, in respect of different audience, you will present different uh, materials and talks? And what would be the receptions in terms of different audience? Thank you. So there was a, a, another question close to you, I think. OK, just in the back, yeah. Oh, yeah, first here and then in the back. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Kapastan, uh, for this wonderful lecture. Um, I'm a student here at the Graduate Institute, and uh, my name is Ding Feng. Um, your lecture actually recalled me of two arguments that I have heard before. One was raised by a, a, a professor from Harvard. His name is uh, Michael Pute. And uh, his argument was that instead of um, dictatorship, China is actually heading towards what we call a meritocracy. Uh, for example, when we see that um, the president himself, uh, Xi Jinping, as well as many other um, uh, Chinese top uh, officials, even at the governor level, they started from a very um, local position and then graduate, uh, gradually promoted to the mayor level, to the governor level, and then to the central committee. As well in the foreign, system, foreign, minute, foreign affairs system, it is the same. They started from the you know, first secretary, Instead of um, like many other countries, the ambassador was um, politically appointed based on um, you know commitments before the elections. And the second argument is that uh, the relationship between economy development and democratization. Uh, what we have seen in many countries is that um, democratization tend to be successful when this country reached to a middle and higher income level and through a top-down approach. For example, what we see in Taiwan, for example, what we have seen in, uh, in South Korea. But um, uh, so here is um, what I'm wondering about this is that is many intellectual from Europe or from America expecting too much from, Ch from China? Like because China's income level has definitely not reached to that like uh, middle higher middle you know, income level, and we're expecting China to become like a, um, a social democracy, we're expecting China to be like democratized. Is that like uh, too much to ask? So that's my question, thank you very much. Um, hi, so uh, I'm, I'm a student here as well. So my name's John and um, actually I have two questions. The first one is related to actually your position in Hong Kong Baptist University because for the past three years, I've been an undergraduate in Hong Kong, University of Hong Kong specifically. So a lot of the political stuff has been very visible, as you can see. And I think a lot of us kind of assume that Hong Kong would be what we call the bastion of the Democrats, of Chinese Democrats. But ever since, of course, the 2014 Umbrella Re Revolution, um, we actually, and the minimal effects that actually has been perceived in a lot of people that I've met actually feel a sense of more apathy, actually, towards the, in what, they perceive to be eroding democracy in, in Hong Kong. In that sense, what do you feel about the state of democracy in a sense in Hong Kong, which I think you'll be able to talk about? And uh, okay. you know, uh, uh, the second question is actually a bit different, is actually about the state of technology and internet, which you've been discussing a lot, because I've been reading a lot about, say, surveillance, the, the uh, advanced surveillance system in China that's been developing, and we've seen a lot of news about this, and how the monitoring system, the ability for the government to be able to monitor its citizens has been well more expanded, and there's even incentivized systems for, say, loyalty to government, or like more citizens to government. Again, I also have to ask you, what does this, uh, what, what, um, um, what kind of um, implications does this have on the state of democracy in China? Thank you. Okay, well, I think I'm going to take these three or four questions, uh, well, five minutes even, uh, together. Uh, reception. Well, thank you for this question. Your question is very interesting because uh, actually I've been teaching in Hong Kong for more than 11 years now, and I teach Chinese politics. That's one of the subjects I teach apart from Japanese politics as well. But I t I've taught Chinese politics to both uh, Hong Kong students, uh, men and Chinese students, and foreign students, exchange students coming from overseas. And the discussion we have are quite interesting. 
Now, for a long time, Hong Kong students were rather, uh, to sort of years when the last question apathic about policy, they were not really interested in policy, or they, did, they, they didn't know much about what was going on in China. I mean, they have very shallow knowledge of the Communist Party system. Now, students from China, and mainland China, were quite interesting, uh, and are still quite interesting, because they're more aware, I mean, they know more about the system. But now you've got two kinds of students from, coming from mainland China. The ones who are interested in politics, you know, they know a lot, they want to ask questions, they, they are, and the ones who are totally oblivious to politics, I mean, they're oblivious to politics, they don't care. Uh, they are middle, uh, middle class uh, kids, you know, and they've, they've, their parents have enough money to sort of uh, subsidize them and pay their studies in Hong Kong, so they come to Hong Kong because they want to acquire Hong Kong permanent residence uh, status, and so that's a major driver for them, it's not politics, they just want to get more benefits and get a Hong Kong ID maybe down the road. So, and it shows that the Chinese society itself is changing as well. Uh, so, but, but for me, it's one of the most uh, rewarding things, you know, what, uh, fruitful dialogue I've ever had is to dialogue on the, not daily, but, uh, you know, weekly basis with, with students and or PhD candidates also uh, from mainland China. And we, we have all sort of discussions, which I tend to them or sort of confirm the fact that I mentioned at the beginning that the Chinese society is very um, pluralistic and open. Even if a lot of people, you know, including young people, have questions, you know, what, you know, whether we should, you know, evolve towards so another political system, how, and, and whether it's uh, like uh, throwing eggs against the wall, you know, with the, the balance of power is pretty uneven. It's uh, is kind of hopeless, and people have other priorities anyway for the time being. So, so, but, but again, the reception has been pretty positive, and I can tell you, I, you know, I've never felt any pressure, as far as I know, at Touchwood in Hong Kong. Uh, one of the reasons maybe because I'm an expatriate, but uh, I've never felt any pressure from the institution or people, you know, from outside, not to teach with, you know, what I teach. So I feel still uh, free, and, and uh, that's why I like Hong Kong, actually. I like teaching there. OK, next question. Yes, two good questions. Dictatorship, meritocracy. Well, that's an old, there's been an ongoing debate about that. Uh, the guy you're referring to is probably Daniel Bell, who is a Canadian guy, who has been a, one of the sycophants of meritocracy. Now, I have to say there is a meritocratic tradition in the Chinese bureaucracy. We know that, and it goes back to the Song Dynasty when uh, civil servants were started to be uh, recruited by, by public examination. And now if you want to join the service service in China, you need to take a public examination uh, exam. Uh, uh, like in most Western democracies, I have to say. Uh, uh, but the distinction between uh, what we call professional bureaucrats or civil servants and politicians is not the same in China. And that's the problem. Because you, in China, if you, when you join the, the bureaucracy, you, you, you become, of course, a civil a public servant, but at the same time, you become a party member. And if you want to go up the ladder, you have to be a party member and you have to show your loyalty to the Communist Party. And the promotion mechanisms are the one of the any Leninist party, which is called the nomenclatura system. So yes, of course, everyone is competent, I have to say. Uh, some are more competent than others. But you know, while Xi Jinping has been chosen among others, it's driven by political considerations and factional infighting more than, than meritocracy. Uh, of course, I mean, on average, everyone is now a, a, a university graduate. Uh, you've got a lot of competence in the Chinese administration, Chinese bureaucracy, there's really some question about it. But I don't think we can qualify the Communist Party system as a meritocratic system. It's a mixture of uh, meritocracy, but also it's a very political system, which is been, promotion is still based on co-optation and, 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 and based on clientelism. I have to say, patron-client relations. You know, if you look at the people Xi Jinping has promoted since he came to power, the old people work with him in Fujian province, in Zhejiang province, and elsewhere. Um, so, you know, that's politics. There is no question about it. Second question, uh, economic, yes, I mean, that's, uh, well, the Lipset uh, theory, uh, you know, at a certain level, you've got a middle class, uh, certain level of standard of living, and then people are going to ask for democracy. Uh, China is not that far from that. Uh, I mean, if you, t if you adopt the Lipsec uh, approach, yes, China is not that very far from that uh, threshold, uh, you know, with 10,000 uh, uh, US dollar uh, average GDP per habitant, it's not too far. Because China was around that uh, level in, in the 80s, um, Korea, South Korea was a bit behind. Um, now, it's not the only factor. 
you mentioned the top-down drive, uh, top-down uh, evolution. Yes, uh, I see that's more likely. Uh, but it's never, you know, democratization processes are never fully top-down. At one point, there is a dialectical game between the, 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 the elites, the leadership, and, and the society. And in Taiwan, which the case I know pretty well, in the late 1980s, when Chong Qingguo decided, again, the, the will of the majority of the Kuomintang establishment and leadership to uh, legalize or tolerate the existence of a position party, the Mintintang, the, the uh, Democratic Progressive Party, uh, that, that was a top-down decision, clearly. Uh, but the meeting then was wrong. I mean, the question is whether you want to organize a crackdown and put everyone in jail or authorize them to operate. So, and, and he made, he made that, the decision we know. So uh, it's never only top-down. The society has, and in, you've got in Taiwan, in, in all over the 70s, a more relaxed authoritarian system where a lot of opposition uh, politicians, what we call the Tanwai, Tanwai Yundong, Tanwai politician, uh, he got involved in local elections and, and put pressure on the on the Kuomintang dictatorship. So I think that's why a very interesting, you know, participation of the society and, and the society played a role and the elites, the local elites played a role as well. So uh, now I think the standard of living is one factor among many, and there are many other factors. And one of the obstacles for China, as opposed to South Korea, right-wing dictatorship like Taiwan, is again political ideology. Uh, and the weight of Soviet Leninism and what I feel Sovietism in China is very, very heavy. And that's going to be an obstacle to any easy democratization of the political system in, in China, as opposed to Taiwan. You know, even Chiang Kai-shek, if you look at the, the uh, ROC, Republic of China Constitution, or South Korea Constitution, apart from state of exceptions, you know, martial law, uh, liberal constitutions, inspired by liberal ideology. So they're not opposed to the principle of one man, one vote, or one person, one vote, but they, you know, they, 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 the, the rationale is to say, well, now we're living exceptional times, we call war, we can't allow democracy, full democracy, but down the road we'll do it. In China, it's not the same. In, in the Communist, I mean, in the Communist Party you think it will stay in power for 1,000 years. There is no transition to anything. You will, I mean, the Communist Party wants to improve the way it governs, the way... I mean, governance, the, the state-society relationship, but he wants to stay in the saddle for, for the long term. So that's the big difference. Anyway, so uh, I hope I have answered. Now, Hong Kong. Well, that's, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, living in Hong Kong, so I'm a sort of uh, I'm a witness of what's going on. And, and uh, my students were involved in the 2014 umbrella movement, including my main student, Chinese students, by the way, something sometimes people forget. I mean, uh, there was no... F Fragmentation. There was no sort of uh, gap between the Hong Kong Chinese students and, and the main Chinese at the time. Now, uh, see, uh, since the Umbrella Movement, there has been a bit of uh, disillusion, pessimism, and apathy, as you mentioned, and people are sort of demobilized in many ways, or fatalists. Uh, but at the same time, I think Hong Kong still has very strong civil society, and um, I don't think that Hong Kong will manage to put it in sort of answer quickly to your question. I don't think that Hong Kong will manage to sort of get full democracy because, after all, Hong Kong is part of China, which is a country run by, you know, ruled by one party, uh, by one party system. So, um, so the, where we are, I mean, we, I think we're going to stay where we are with a semi democratic parliament, the LegCo, with a CE chief executive who, who is elected by an uh, electoral committee dominated by the establishment and pro China people. And even if we move to all universal suffrage, the vetting system will remain the vetting system which is uh, actually uh, in place today, which is to, uh, for the Communist Party and the pro-establishment people to select the candidates. So only people who are acceptable, candidates who are acceptable by Beijing will be able to run in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a full election done if, if the system is introduced, uh, which is not the case yet. So I'm rather pessimistic on that front. But I, st I still think that Hong Kong society is open, liberal. You have a lot of NGOs, a lot of religious organizations with activities in China, uh, human rights organizations, and they will resist, I think. It will be hard. Uh, I think they will pass the, anti the, uh, the, the national security law. There will be more restrictions. I mean, we've seen already restrictions to... You can't promote independence in Hong Kong. I mean, if you start promoting independence, if you're a Hong Kong guy, you can go to jail. 
uh, your party is going to be dismantled and using the anti-mafia law to dismantle. I mean, that's what they did for dismantling the National Party of Hong Kong, uh, the a few months, a few weeks ago. And if you're a foreigner, you're going to be deported. So uh, that's what happened to the FT guy uh, in a few, few, few weeks ago. So, so there are restrictions. And then the, 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 the returning officer can also choose the, the candidate on the, and, and prevent candidates he or she doesn't like uh, from running t uh, in the uh, local election. So, so you've got more and more limitations, and that worries them. That, that's uh, the way it is. Okay, so like, let's take the final two questions. I think one here and Olivier. Yeah, um, hello, thank you, Mr. Cabestan. Um, my name is Rafa, I'm a former student at Peking University. Uh, my question is pretty different, not only internal, but like more external elements. So China has been like increasingly active in the international community and sort of like a favor of stable multilateral system. But uh, it's also been like recently much more diplomatically assertive with other mostly Western countries on very sensitive topics so, and has not hesitated to like expand monitoring of Chinese citizens outside of China. So in this context, I wanted to know your opinion. Uh, what is the, the impact or like the influence of uh, external uh, pressure, so either diplomatic or from international civil society, in supporting these democratic elements in society, or at least in denouncing a major human rights violations, such as what's happening in Xinjiang, or uh, crackdown on human rights lawyers. So would like external pressure plus China to be, to adopt like a harsher position, or would uh, like more, even more assertive, or would the party, is, is the party still capable of accepting external criticism? Thank you. Maybe I'm gonna, since the mic is coming, I'm gonna answer first and then, oh, you, okay, 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 okay. Thank you very much. My name is Olivier Torotini. I'm the president of the Association Genève Asie, um, and I've been fascinated by your expose. You have talked at times about the inequalities. You have talked about the notion that the government will uh, try to provide as many measures of protection for the population so as to uh, allay their worry about their future. But this has considerable fi uh, financial implications. And my question is about the current tax system, its qualities, inefficiencies, and the trends that, would, uh, that you would expect. Thank you. Uh, external pressure. You know, if you look at the past, external pressure on the Chinese government has not yielded the you know, expected results. Uh, it has, uh, on the contrary, contributed to sort of stiffening the government's position at least on the surface uh, in, or in public, make the government, the Chinese government, even more, more rigid, less ready to compromise, to, you know, to, to debate. Uh, look, at, look at the debate about the Xinjiang uh, uh, detention centers, which are extrajudicial detention centers. No, you know, there is no recourse before a court if you would detain against your will somewhere. Uh, and the Chinese don't want to sort of uh, debate about those things, uh, including in the UN. We'll see how it goes. I mean, uh, that's not the end of it. But uh, so, no, I, I think the, no, you know, if I kind of broaden a bit your question, I think pressure will come from the society. I don't think external pressure is going to do. You know, a lot of countries, a lot of government, a lot of people have, uh, since the mid 19th century, have, have tried coming from the outside, I've tried to change China. There's been a myth among American missionaries, among you know, French priests or, you know, uh, and foreign governments. The Ch China is going to be changed by the Chinese, not by us. And uh, so that's, that's the, the, the bottom line, I guess. Um, of course, external pressures can have an impact on the way China is going to um, sort of adjust its economic system. Uh, I think the, the, the trade war with the U.S. will force China to, at least to some degree, open up its market uh, to put an end to some of the more, most visible or shocking non-trade barriers. Uh, but at the same time, China is not going to give up with this Made in China 2025. It's not going to give up, and I understand that, with its own industrial policy. Uh, try to get acquire as, as you know as many high techs from uh, abroad as, as possible. So again, 
and the, the current with Xi Jinping, and we have, we, and in my book, by the way, I've tried to go beyond Xi Jinping, and I think Xi Jinping is maybe a, himself a weakness in the whole system, and so we have to think in beyond him. Um, as we may know, I mean, you may know that today, as we speak, he's more, his power is, I wouldn't say fragile, but he's, he's a bit more contested, that was the case a year ago. Uh, that started in, in, in the summer, and you see more and more criticism against him. So whether you're going to achieve a third term remains to be seen. We'll see. I mean, there's a big battle within the party, uh, which has been sort of intensified by the trade war with the U.S. Uh, I don't think he's, uh, he's going to you know, lose power in the kind of coup uh, in the coming, maybe I'm wrong, but in the coming month. I think he's going to stay in power at least in 2023, and then we'll see. Uh, but, but, but external pressure is not going to change uh, much the Chinese leadership's uh, position. So, but does it mean that we, we should do nothing? You know, I, I think we should still uh, raise our voice. And but uh, that's another issue. Uh, how much even sanctions? You know, if we countries or governments envisage sanction, whether they have an impact. Very often, I mean, there's been a lot of the whole literature of the impact of sanctions in international politics. The only country which uh, sort of uh, gave up or was influenced by sanctions is South Africa. Uh, Iran has, was not. I mean, well, you can debate about other cases, but okay. So that's, uh, that's uh, I think, more general issue. Now, regarding finance, yes, finance is a big, big limitation. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I think the taxation system is going through another. Um, modernization and recentralization. Um, there were a number of, you know, uh, recentralization reforms and attempts. Uh, the, f the major ones was in 20 years ago launched by Zhu Zhongti in 94 and 95, which has allowed the government, the central authorities, to have more leeway and more leverage to sort of redistribute resources among, you know, provinces and, and to help, look, you know, localities which need more help. So and when Jabba later abolished a number of very controversial taxes, like the agricultural tax, which penalized farmers for peasants a lot. So, but still, you have a lot of localities which uh, are in the red, which don't have the means to pay the, you know, the, for education and basic services, and, and we see that more uh, today. And that's an issue. Uh, and that's why there will be, I think, down the road, another tax reform um, in order to allow localities to have more resources. Uh, but that's, a, that's an ongoing issue. I mean, and I have to say, I mean, bro more broadly, that the, the, and that's part of the strong administrative tradition of China, and that's an element of continuity, I don't deny, actually. It is strong administrative, I mean, the fact that you've got an administration which can be pretty competent compared to other developing countries' administration. It's more a developed country administration, I have to say. And, you know, there's an argument for historians, I don't know if Nicola will agree with me, that China introduced, uh, that's debatable, the, the most modern, pre-modern administration system, or bureaucratic system. Uh, and, it's, and, then, and, and this tradition and this expertise is very, is very vivid and living and, and useful for modernizing the state. Now, the downside, of course, is that in China, the, the state is always somewhere, very close to you. And so it provides a lot of services. It provides also a lot of, um, it has a lot of mechanism for controlling society. And something I mentioned in my book, I didn't mention in my presentation, because you may, someone, there was a question about control, social surveillance and control. The social credit system, which is a kind of, uh, I mean, a war, worrisome system of surveillance, because, you, you know, if it's extended to the whole country and you, you gather big data about everyone in the country, 1.4 billion people, and with all the algorithms, you can sort of preempt what they're going to do. Uh, you can check on them. Uh, it's kind of a Orwellian system which is going to be put into place. And that, that, that's pretty frightening. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's, it's going to be um, fully operational and there will be some limitations. Even in China, you know, uh, the, the protection of privacy, and, and as you know, is, uh, is, is pretty limited uh, as we speak. But um, yes, I mean, to answer your question, uh, it's an ongoing uh, um, reform, and, uh, but by and large, the government has the means to continue to, to um, levy taxes uh, and, and redistribute resources among, among, among localities and people when need be. Okay, so perhaps a last kind of quick concluding question. We have been discussing changes within China 
or the absence of change in some respect. Uh, when putting this in perspective uh, globally, how do you see the changing representation or changing influence of the Chinese model, politically speaking? Yes, well, <laughs> even in China, it's, there is a debate about that because China denied that they're trying to export their model. Uh, what the Xi Jinping said in his report to the Congress last year, he said, uh, we, we can propose our own solutions, our, our own answers to the questions or challenges uh, other countries are facing. Um, but but clear, clearly, I mean, to uh, sort of echo one of the questions about China's assertiveness, yes, China is more assertive, is more on the offensive, uh, both in its criticism of what, what it calls Western democracy and uh, separation of power, you know, independence of the judiciary, all those things are taboo in China, and uh, as I mentioned in my paper at the conference. Uh, but also in the offensive and in, in the uh, everywhere, I mean, in the questioning Western democracy and and promoting its own and, and, and trying to demonstrate that the, the one-party system is the best for developing a country. Uh, so now whether it has an impact on the global scene, uh, I think remains to be seen. Uh, I work personally, I work a lot on China-Africa relations and uh, what you see, what I've observed in the last few years, I've observed convergence between China and a number of African or developing countries all the way from Ethiopia, Rwanda, uh, but if an African or developing country is democratic and, and has a, you know, a, a sort of a multi-party democracy, this country is not going to sort of put an end to, this, to, to, to its political regime for, for the sake of, the, of developing the country. Uh, if you take the, the case of Ivory Coast or Senegal, or, uh, or even today, what is interesting, Ethiopia, which is moving back to some more open democracy than at the time of uh, Melezenawi or the Saleng, uh, it's quite interesting to see uh, how it's going to impact on China, uh, on, on Ethiopia-China relations. Uh, because China has promoted, you know, a lot of uh, mm, cooperation programs. The, China trains a number of uh, developing countries, cadres, and not only China, but the Communist Party itself. So you've got a lot of party-to-party -party relationship with developing countries, uh, political parties, in, in particular in the, in the ones which are authoritarian, but not only in the ones which are authoritarian. But again, I mean, the best student today, in Af we speak in Africa, the best student of China may be Kagame in Rwanda. But even Kagame doesn't claim that he is inspired by China. His mother is more Singapore, uh, so, uh, which is uh, quite different from, from China uh, to some respect. But uh, even if it's also a kind of a top-down authoritarian system of modernization. So yes, I see convergence. But again, uh, we, we, we live in a period of time, so that's what we have to put things into perspective, because we live in a period of time where democracy, the way we understand democracy is criticized. You've, you've got the rise of populism. People are unhappy with the system. Uh, but again, uh, whether in our uh, countries we're going to sort of uh, uh, put an end to our system because we think there are flaws, uh, remains to be seen. I think, again, my answer is to improve democracy rather than to sort of uh, try to abandon democracy because I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a convincing answer in the long term. So, so that's why in this kind of uh, battle we're having with China and other countries um, like Russia and others about the, what, what, what do we mean by democracy, um, we have to demonstrate that we're doing better and that's what we need to improve. With this conclusion, Jean-Pierre, I would like to thank you very much for this extremely interesting and thought-provoking talk and conversation with the audience. Thank you very much to the audience for joining from the Grad Institute, from uh, the University of Geneva, from the Geneva Asia Society, with uh, Olivier Turetini uh, helping us also to organize this, uh, this event, and from all the different places that uh, the uh, audience came from. So I would like to invite you perhaps to continue uh, elaborating on that also with the, uh, the book that uh, is now, I think, available also in, uh, in our library in our library, and also to, to, to purchase in the bookshops. And I would like to invite you also to the our next talk in this uh, Disbanding Rule of Law lecture series, which will be on Thursday, 29th of November, here in the same room with uh, Martin Krieger, who is professor, professor of social theory and law at uh, Sydney University. And his talk will be entitled, 
What's the point of the rule of law? Question mark. So, see you then. Thank you and have a good afternoon.